So I'm Brad Fenley. I'm at the University of British Columbia, Vancouver. And um, basically, I want to tell you about broaden the horizons a bit, get beyond IBD, and then we're going to start talking about um, raising your kids in the world. And you've heard about diet, and I'm going to tell you about microbes. Um, so basically, my goal tonight is two things. One, convince you microbes are really important for kids. And secondly, is try and keep you awake and tell you something that, uh, that you can actually take home. So when we think about microbiology, and you've probably heard of the microbiome, and all it's all press these days, the last decade, it's been a very exciting area. But ironically, we've got to go back a long ways to learn when microbes were first discovered. And there was this Anthony Van Leeuwenhoek, he made his microscope, and he held it up, and he saw all these wiggling microbes in his mouth. And he made the stunning observation, that there's a lot of microbes, there's more microbes in my mouth than there are all the people living in homes at the time. That's when microbes were first discovered. That's a long time ago, 300 and whatever odd um, years ago. But really didn't do much with them until about 125 years ago when these two guys came along. Robert Koch and Louis Pasteur, probably the two most famous microbiologists in the world. And what they did is they showed that microbes cause disease. Up until then, we didn't have any idea what caused most of what we now know as infectious diseases. Bad air, swamp air, who knows what it was. These guys showed that microbes cause disease. And Louis Pasteur went the next step further. He showed that if you killed the microbes, if you pasteurize them, that's where the word pasteurization comes from, basically, then you didn't get the disease. So if microbes cause disease and killing them gets rid of disease, what do you want to do? We want to kill microbes, right? So society went on this major kill all microbes kind of campaign. So we brought in sanitation, um, and we cleaned up the sewers in the city. Um, we started, <laughs> antibiotics were invented, World War II. These were wonder drugs. Antibiotics kill microbes. So now we kill lots of microbes. And in the 1960s, hand sanitizer was invented. Kills 99.9% .9 of bacteria. This is good stuff, right? We can get rid of these microbes. And that's what society did. And the coolest thing is, it worked. So when you take a look at the last 50 years of, of, of infectious diseases, pick your infectious diseases. They, they've basically gone. We do not see the diseases we used to see. Um, you know, rheumatic fever, scarlet fever, all the mumps, measles, TB. You pick your disease. They've all gone like this. So that's triumph for humanity, right? We have won the battle against infectious diseases. Well, kind of. So the second half of the curve is on the right-hand side. And that's all the stuff we've been hearing about tonight already. And um, we've heard about um, inflammatory bowel diseases, Crohn's diseases, but type 1 diabetes, asthma, MS. Look around the world we live in. What do people have now? It's these kind of diseases. They don't have measles, mumps, TB, rubella. That's not, that's not killing them these days. So the big question is, what has happened these last 50 years? And what I want to try and convince you of is that as we've gotten rid of all these microbes that cause disease, we also got rid of a lot of the beneficial microbes. And ironically, <laughs> that's having the effect on that right-hand curve. By getting rid of these microbes, we were affecting the normal microbes we have, and that's really causing major problems. So when I look out at you, when you look around the audience, what do you see? A bunch of people, right? Wrong. What you should see is basically a bunch of microbes on this human vessel, because there's at least as many microbes in and on you as there are humans. They have a hundred times more genetic material than you do, than Homo sapiens. So I always tell my students, you're more microbial than human, and they seem to take that as an insult. I think it's a compliment, frankly. Um, okay, so we have a lot of microbes living on, in and on us. The numbers are astounding, 100 trillion microbes. I mean, if you take one gram of feces, which is about the size of your little finger, there's more microbes in there than all the people on this entire planet. Similarly, one hand, there's more microbes in one of your hands than all the people living on the planet. The numbers are astounding. You can't see them, but they're there, and there's lots of them. So, okay, we got microbes. Do they have anything to do with all the stuff we're talking about? So on the left is a list of various diseases that we see in our society today. Crohn's disease is up there, um, various other diseases, MS, diabetes, obesity, all are common society problems, right? Well, over the last few years, we've gotten really good at sequencing these microbes and seeing who's there and who isn't. And what we realize, that in every one of these diseases case, the microbes are different in people that have the disease than in people that don't have the disease. We call this dysbiosis. So basically, they become imbalanced. That doesn't say they're causing it, 
but it's a real smoking gun to say that basically the microbes are different if you have this disease than normal. Okay, that's interesting. Well, can we do something about it? So this is my absolutely favorite topic. It's fecal transfers. Basically, you take feces from a healthy person, put it in a diseased person, and in some cases of disease, such as Clostridium difficile, they get better. It's horribly gross, but it's a really neat concept that says that some of those diseases can actually be cured by, um, by transferring microbes from one person into another. And as I said, with Clostridium difficile, um, antibiotics give you maybe a 25% cure rate. Fecal transfer gives you a 96% cure rate. And this is a life-threatening disease. Don't try dulling that number, by the way. This, was a, this hour has 22 minutes skit. So if you ever watch the skit, yeah, I guarantee you will, you, you will laugh so hard. Anyway. Okay, well, one of the things we realized, the important things, is these microbes affect how our immune system develops. You've heard a lot about immunity and IBD and the inflammation and things. It turns out microbes can push how our immune system goes. They can push it different ways. And this really occurs early in life, the first few months of life. Your immune system counters microbes, and they basically talk to it. And they say, OK, you don't want to be asthmatic, allergic type thing. Let's be normal. Or you don't want to be more susceptible to things like IBD. And Tom told you about some of the immunology in that one. And just to give you an example, um, one area that we've worked on is asthma. So here's four things that actually increase your chances to get asthma. If you ride a chicken and live on the farm, you're protected against asthma about 20%. Antibiotics are in life increase asthma. C-section gives you a 20% increase in asthma and breastfeeding. And what do all these things have in common? You can imagine, of course, microbes. So when I started this, um, we basically set out in the lab to see if we could prove it, because no one had proved this before. And like most scientists, you initially start with a mouse model. So we start with young mice or older mice, and we gave them antibiotics. Now, antibiotics kill microbes. Yes, they kill infectious diseases, but they carpet bomb all microbes. They're really terrible on, or they're good at killing a lot of microbes. So what we found is that if we gave antibiotics in really young mice, just as they're developing, just after they're born, the asthma rates went through the roof. If we give the antibiotics later in life, muck up the microbes later in life, it was no effect. So that was telling us that early in life, you need these microbes so that you don't go to an asthmatic type thing. We then went on to do a bunch of studies in children and came up with exactly the same answer. The first three months of life are absolutely critical to get this microbial exposure. And if you have antibiotics or C-section, your microbes are screwed up, you don't get exposed to them. That makes you much more susceptible to asthma. And we're able to identify certain microbes that you really do seem to need. And all these things we're doing to these microbes is um, basically um, making us more at risk for getting asthma. OK, well, you've heard a lot about IBD. Um, and you've already heard that microbes are different in, in kids with IBD. We don't know if because the gut is inflamed, the microbes are different. So of course they look different. Or are there certain microbes that are in the gut that are making you more susceptible to getting this inflammation that causes IBD? My favorite, we work on diarrhea. It's our bread and butter. We've studied it for years. Um, it turns out that if you, in, in our most models of salmonella and E. coli diarrhea, you can take a mouse strain that would always get severe diarrhea and die, and a resistant mouse strain that doesn't get severe diarrhea and die with the same infection, if you put the feces from this mouse strain into this one, you can protect it from disease. Similarly, if you take the susceptible animal's feces into the resistant one, it now gets the disease. And all we did is swap the microbes. That says that microbes play a profound effect in these um, intestinal diseases. A really fascinating area is microbes in the brain. We call this the gut-brain axis. It turns out these microbes, we know the brain talks to the gut. But now we're starting to realize the microbes through the gut actually are able to talk, or in the gut, are able to talk to the brain. There's some really interesting studies coming out on autism and the role of microbes in this. If you take an anxious, a stressed, or a depressed mouse, do a fecal transfer to normal mice, those normal mice get anxious, stressed, or depressed. If you take a depressed person's feces, put it in mice, they basically exhibit depressive behavior. And all we're doing is swapping feces. What does that mean? And so it's, we don't know a lot about this yet, um, but it's, it's certainly, I mean, stay tuned, because it's going to be a fascinating area in the future how the microbes influence the brain. 
Okay, well, I've been talking about kids, um, but none of us getting any longer, I mean younger, and um, basically I want to talk a little bit, finish up this talk about not just kids, but also later in life, or just all through your life. You've heard a lovely story on, on diet, and whenever I hear the word diet, that to me just means you're feeding the microbes that are then feeding you. And um, so here's a really morbid study. Here's the top 10 reasons why you're going to die in Canada and the U.S. When you look through this, how many of these are microbial? Obviously microbial. Number eight, influenza and pneumonia. Streptococcus pneumonia is a bacterium, influenza virus. Yeah, we knew that. But who would think any of these other diseases would actually have an effect? How many of these diseases do you think are associated with microbes? I can now go through this, this whole list, and nine of these ten, I can show you some quite convincing evidence that there's microbes are playing a role in these diseases. This is just changing medicine as we know it. The only one I can't is accidents. You can't say the microbes made me do it. Um, well, they affect depression, so maybe suicide um, counts in there, for example, there. So just to give you a hint of, of how, how we're thinking in this, um, cardiovascular disease. So that's heart attacks and strokes, right? Atherosclerosis. It turns out when you eat red meat, microbes in you break red meat down, pieces of it, something called phosphocholine, into a molecule called TMA. And then that molecule goes to your liver, it becomes oxidized, it becomes TMAO. TMAO is basically what causes atherosclerosis. Hmm. Okay, so microbes are needed for the first step. If you take microbes out of the equation, you take a germ-free animal that has no microbes in it, feed it all the red meat you want, it will never get atherosclerosis. Vegans and vegetarians don't eat red meat, they don't get atherosclerosis, or very, very much lower levels. And the real exciting, exciting thing in this at least in mice so far, is if you drug the microbe enzymes that do that first step breakdown, so they can't break that red meat down anymore, even though you feed these mice copious quantities of red meat, they don't get atherosclerosis. So maybe in the future, you can actually have your steak and eat it too, sort of thing. You actually drug these enzymes, so you drug the bugs, and then you get the disease. And that's two of the top four reasons why people die right there. Getting back to diet, here's something that ties into diet and also ties into microbes. So Alzheimer's, that's dementia, right? Um, horrible disease. It turns out that there's this diet, it's called the MIND diet, that can have a profound influence on Alzheimer's disease. So the study came out, and they call this the MIND diet. It's basically the Mediterranean diet and a bit of modified um, um, vascular disease. Yeah, take pictures of it. This, this is really important. And ironically, this is just what Andrea told you. You know, you eat your vegetables, your whole grains, your nuts, you're allowed one glass of red wine a day, yay, that's good. Berries, all the stuff you know you're supposed to eat, all the stuff, olive oil, all the stuff your mom said you should eat, that's good for you. Now we know it's good for your microbes, and that's good for you. Stay away from red meat, butter stick, margarine, cheese, fried food, pastries, sweets. Again, the Western diet. And this is not just a one-off. There's now been three studies come out on this. And basically, by following this diet, you can decrease Alzheimer's dementia by over 50%. That's just stunning. So I'm going to finish there. Um, I've written two books now. The first one's called Let Them Eat Dirt. And that's all about how to raise your kids with your microbes and things. <coughs> and if any of you are having a kid, I highly recommend reading it. If you have to go baby shower, it's a perfect baby shower gift. Um, it basically says all the things I've been saying. And it's helpful, hence it's, it's written with the science behind it, but it's been made for helpful. This other book is just coming out this week or next. I wrote it with my daughter, who's a gerontologist. And this is basically, OK, you've had your kids. What are you going to do now? You're not getting any younger. How can you? Um, live healthily and age healthy with your microbes. And um, it, it, it was a fascinating journey in this one. I learned so many things I never even dreamt microbes could influence. For example, menopause in women, they affect estrogen. Many, many things here. Again, it's written for the, per the average person to be able to understand. Lots of helpful hints and things. So with that, live long and may you and your microbes prosper. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>